I sometimes feel that I can kind of be in balance with the past and the future, you know, being there, but connected with the time. And then there are miracles happening. I am Marie Kodama, pianist, and this is Living the Classical Life. Today we visit the Kimsey in Bavaria, a region of otherworldly beauty, where an Irish traveling monk founded one of the earliest Christian convents. Over the centuries, the tiny Fraueninsel, or Ladies' Island, ruled lands and villages from the Danube to southern Tyrol, survived attacks by Huns and Turks, and is to this day inhabited by a small number of Benedictine nuns. It's here that we talk with Mari Kodama about her life as a pianist, in particular her relationships with the legendary Tatiana Nikolaeva and her longtime mentor, Alfred Brendel. So, Mari, thank you so much for joining me on this series. It's it's a real honor to to, (laughs) to welcome you here to the series. I'm really looking forward. (laughs) So, I wanted to ask about one specific performance that you had when you were, I think, quite quite young. 1995 was when you first played in Carnegie Hall? Oh, yes, yeah. For young people who come to you and might tell you that they're nervous for a performance like that. Yeah. Are there ways to put well, yourself in a good zone? I think it's much more difficult today for younger people because first of all, everything is streamed. Mm. So it's different than when you are live. In life, it's a diff- there's different energy. If there's one note that's wrong, if the energy is there, it doesn't matter. And it's totally different when you know that the entire world is looking at you while you're playing. And... Um, it must be very difficult for them to focus, to find your focus, and it's even more important to not have this core in yourself that doesn't move, and probably everyone has to work on it to just shut everything and find again your timing, your energy, or, you know, your speed of life. The speed of life. Do you feel like with the changing of the musical world that the speed of our lives is also changing? I think so. It's also because um, you get so much information and uh, I must say it's very difficult to choose what to absorb. And um, for our generation, we have a lot of life experience of life sound and for for me for example um, my best memory is how people have played like Nikolaeva or or the sound or the way they breathe and if you don't have it then if you all the information is from YouTube it's very difficult I can imagine to make a choice and how do you know what is right I'm so glad that you brought up Nikolaeva I think most young people these days don't necessarily know who she was. Mm. Maybe some of them who are recording collectors know that she recorded a lot of Shostakovich and yes, Bach. Yes. Who was she? And what was your connection to her? Well, um, unfortunately, she passed away so young and um, 
just a few years after that she could play in everywhere in the world. But I was very lucky to know her even at Soviet time. Mm. And she was teaching um, in just smaller places, like in Tours in France, you know, in Japan, Germany, very rarely in France. And I must say, I, my career has really started thanks to her because my debut uh, was Prokofiev's third piano concerto and I prepared this with Nikolai ever. And it was just amazing because she was on the second piano every day with me and she was the best orchestra as you can imagine. She played the orchestra part, but it was just amazing. And just by playing with her, you remember how it should go. Nikolaeva, what was she like as, as a person? What was her energy? I had the impression or the feeling that her way of making music is very honest. Yes, yes. Absolutely, this is exactly the word. Very honest, extremely um, warm personality, but very strong. I must say, I really miss her so much. Um, she had a way of just being, and uh, she would just take everyone around with her into her personality and she also had a gift to really have only nice people around her so being around her was always very pleasant because she was surrounded by interesting nice people and when she played it was incredible sound and she had really very small hands and she was using really everything to play a Tchaikovsky concerto or a Schumann concerto <laughs> So I'm I'm looking at your long list of recordings, repertoire, halls around the world where you've performed, conductors. You've done so much, including recording all the Beethoven sonatas? Yes. How do you find the balance, not just in your career mm -hmm. trajectory, if we call it that, but mm -hmm. your your daily life? Is that is that something you're thinking about? Well, I have um for me the profession, the music and family are both equally important. So it's very important to find the total commitment to both. So, uh, but I was very lucky to be able to always find a repertoire that's interesting musically. And also my mentor, Alfred Brandl's advice was you have to explore everything until you are 30. I didn't know that Brendel said that, but when I'm listening to you say that, it makes sense. Maybe he meant more than just trying out all the repertoire. Maybe he's exploring your fullest identity. Yes, I think so. He said to establish your identity, you have to know them all. But then also in life, um, you have to make some choices after a while. So his advice is when you're 30, try to make a choice so that you can um, have some composers with whom you can spend all your life. So a commitment to few composers. So this is what I did with Beethoven. I was very lucky. For 10 years I did only Beethoven, but it was never boring. And then I came back to my original repertoire, which was French repertoire, because I grew up in France with French teacher and French language. So to me, it feels very, very natural. So always coming back to Ravel, Debussy, Messiaen, uh, Dutieu is something like breathing air for me. Now, you described Brendel as being a mentor in every sense. Yes. Oh, because... Um, not only piano lessons, uh, but he uh, also took me to museums and we discussed art. And not only he was analyzing and telling me or guiding me through some art pieces that he liked in certain museums, but also he asked me what I like and it was not always the same thing. And then we analyzed together what is it that's so wonderful in those pieces and why we have the sensitivity to the paintings or sculpture. And also we discussed about literature. And uh, so it was a very global, let's say not education, because he never really gave lessons. Um, when I met him, he didn't have any student. So 
I was very lucky to meet him through a friend. And because of he was a very good friend of Brendel, he said, okay, to do a favor, I will listen to you, but I only have one hour. That kind of thing. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I went and played Haydn Sonata, a big uh, uh, mi bemol majeur. And uh, he said, okay, we can only do uh, half of the first movement. But just come back again. And then I came back and I came back. So this is how it continued. About two, three times a year when he was having his kind of sabbatical, he always had two months or three months out of the year where he stayed home to study. So that's when I went to his house at Well Walk in London and had lessons two, three days in a row. And then... He was very kind to always invite me for lunch so that we can continue the discussion over meal. I'm so glad that you mentioned Haydn because it seems to me that uh, Brendel was also so interested in humor, not just in music, but mm -hmm. just in life in general. Was that your impression? When yes, you absolutely. And he said you shouldn't forget humor in your life. And uh, so was Beethoven. Beethoven was a very humorous person, and uh, it wasn't really the impression overall worldwide of Beethoven at that time. Everyone thought he's very academic, very serious, and very square. But Brendel said, no, no, it, there are many, many humorous quotes in his music, so just look for those things. So when you worked your way through the Beethoven sonatas, mm -hmm. And then you were preparing all sorts of works for a recording. How much of that did you have a chance to play for him? Well, I didn't play all 32 sonatas, but uh, I mostly also called him to ask advices about certain constructions, some tempi. But um, I have worked so much uh, with Brendel that even when we talk over the phone, I understand his language now and of course I consulted every um, sonata with Brendel. When you're performing Beethoven or any other music for example, do you ever feel uh, the comforting presence of your, your teachers and mentors that, ah, okay, here's, here's the difficult uh, Hammerklavier sonata, mm. but Alfred Brendel told me this, that will get me through this, this music. I always was a little stubborn and um, sometimes had really fight with my teachers. Um, even if they're great, great teachers, if it was against my nature, I just couldn't do it. Because some, sometimes, you know, you can imitate or do without really thinking, but then it somehow didn't feel right. So at the end, I had to interpret it in my way <laughs> and do it, uh, digest it first and then play it, especially Brendel because he's so, so precise and very different from where I came from, from the French school. And he used to tell me, no, don't play like a little French girl. <laughs> but I'm not an Austrian man, you know, so... Uh, It took always two, three months after the lesson to digest and then play it. But when Brendel came to the concert, and when it was really convinced by myself, he always was convinced. So he was not this kind of um, very narrow-minded person who would say, no, this is the only way to do it. He told me how it should go, and then, of course, it's balanced for himself, but maybe it wouldn't. To, to me. And it's very interesting because another student of Brendel at uh, Till Fellner, who was a good friend of mine, I, have a I had a conversation with him and he said, mm, I didn't really have this problem. <laughs> But Paul Lewis, who is a British pianist, said, oh, I always need some time to digest Brendel's lesson. <laughs> to so I think we, all three of us, we come from a very different um, background. Till comes from Austrian background, I come from a French background, and Paul is British. And we all um, are very close to, to Brendel, but uh, we have taken and digested um, each of us in a different way. And he's, um, he's not criticizing us for that. So you talked about Brendel taking two months 
as, as a period to, well, it, it doesn't sound like that was vacation for him, but at least a change of perspective. He is someone who never stayed status quo. And even for some pieces that he has played, let's say 350 times, he would always rethink about it. And I saw him several times, even recently I played something for him. Uh, it was a Beethoven third piano concerto. And then he was looking and said, why did Beethoven write this for Zandl? And of course, he has played it probably 3,500 times. <laughs> and then we discussed about it. Why this time, but not the next time when it comes back? And so he's always, always, always asking questions and changing his interpretation as well. I mean, he recorded Beethoven sonatas three times, three times. right? And concerto... At least twice, At I least think. Twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we're continuing with the subject of wellness and balance, mm -hmm. I keep obsessing about this topic, but do we really need to feel well when we play? I mean, maybe you can still give a affecting performance mm -hmm. of a difficult Beethoven sonata, mm -hmm. perhaps even especially if you are not feeling well. It, it, Beethoven's life was difficult by most standards. It's true. Well, for sure, I'm not sure how about you, but I never ever feel very well before performing. Never. <laughs> so, but sometimes, I mean, sometimes everything falls in place. I mean, nice piano, nice audience, nice acoustic, and then it's easier to approach what you have in mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you... I sometimes feel that I can kind of be in balance with the past and the future, you know, being there, but connected with the time. And then there are mir miracles happening. You know? I'm, I, I love that idea that the miracles can happen unexpectedly. Did you ever have it happen where you had the feeling of discomfort before the performance and you were almost expecting it to not go well, but suddenly, for some reason, it did go well. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Well, it's a balance of everything, because if you're really into the performance, uh, it's very good, but then you kind of also have to feel the whole, right? Because, I mean, the acoustic changes every time when you play. Even if you have rehearsed in the hall with audience in there, it changes. And um, you have to be aware and you have to adjust. It means that you cannot be only focused about you and the piano, the instrument. And uh, so you, you always keep an um, idea that how it would sound in the back of the hall, for example. And, but if you only think about that, then you cannot focus anymore. So it's kind of um, a simultaneous thinking which is like one twentieth of seconds, which is over um, human power, right? Mm -hmm. um, even the most intelligent Nobel Prize scientists cannot control this. And this is, for me, um, the miracle of music. And uh, when talking about balance, I think when you are performing and when we are performing and we have this moment, then everything is rewarded. Um, even all the hard work <laughs> to prepare the concert. But of course, it doesn't always happen. Do you feel like audiences in different places listen in different ways, give different energies? Is that specific to countries or cultures? Yes, but if you are honest with yourself and um, also honest to the composer and to the music, then they always come with you. I never had the experience where... It was really unpleasant. So I think it's at the end, it's a contact from human to human. As performers, is it possible to play in a way that invites um, more active listening? That they might yes. be listening in one way, and then you play in a very specific way, and then you notice that they're listening better. Yes. Uh, both... Uh, Nikolai and Brendel taught me that you have to, you know, to be a true master, you have to control time. 
And this is something that I feel that, you know, we all have our heartbeat, which is rather steady. And there must be a pulse, because otherwise, you know, it's, you don't really understand the music. The mu music has pulse, but it should be you know, a little bit moving, but in a way that people don't really notice. And then they don't they feel uncomfortable at one moment. So I think it's a, really a control of time and breathing also, timing, which makes it interesting without people really noticing. Because if you're too, too much in comfort zone, you, you, you fall asleep. What happens when young people come to you and they're exploring their own growth as a musician? Maybe they tell you that they feel like they've reached a point where they're not growing and they're discouraged. How can we deal with those time periods? <laughs> it's familiar, I think, to most musicians yes, at some point. Yes, and I think we all have to go through that. And in life, we regularly come back to a time where you think, mm, I don't know where to go from there. But I think probably the best would be, first of all, to come back to yourself, to be true yourself. Um, because sometimes you try to imitate something that's not really yourself. I'm not saying that you just should do n'importe quoi, which means just anything, because you have to respect, in classical music, the score. I mean, there's a reason why Mozart wrote all those notes and Beethoven. And But the balance to of the interpretation that you see it, but then how to integrate to yourself so that you can give it back to the audience in a way that you feel comfortable. I think probably you have this uh, blockage because of the ba you're out of balance. You know, if you find the balance between the composer and yourself as the interpreter, then probably you can just fly again. <laughs> What are your hopes for some of the projects that you're looking forward to in the future? You've covered so much Beethoven. Do you ever feel like, okay, now it's time to explore something else, even though I love it so much? Mm -hmm. Are there some other directions? Oh, absolutely, that yeah. I always try to put a new repertoire um, every year. And uh, last, year, last year was Henze Piano Concerto, and this year is Ligeti Piano Concerto. And the year before was a new piece that was written for me by a young French composer, Rodolphe Bruno Boulmier, who is a really, really talented composer. So I'm, every year I do something else. And I came back this year to Mendelssohn Piano Concerto, which I haven't played since a really long time. And it's nice to come back to romantic repertoire. And from next year on, I'm going back to Beethoven uh, sonatas. But... Um, with this French composer, Rodolphe Bruno Boulmier, writing some quotes in between. So we have tried it in one concert uh, that he wrote a connecting piece between piano sonatas, and then you hear the Beethoven sonatas differently, but you have to do it very delicately so, so that it doesn't bother Beethoven. So this is an experiment I will start doing next year. And finally, You've described the life philosophy and the inspiration that you got from your musical mentors. I wonder, have there been people in your life who made a big impact in, on you with inspiration or life philosophy who were not musicians? Yes. Um, we, there is a physicist, scientist, physicist, uh, Donald Glaser, and uh, he won a um, Nobel Prize when he was 32 or so, one of the youngest Nobel Prize winner, and he unfortunately passed away. But he also was a violist and played in, quart uh, in a quartet with um, Einstein. And so he was a very musical scientist. And he was the one who said, you know, you have to always, always uh, change your challenge every two, 10 years <laughs> and um, have a different focus. Of course, you stay yourself, but then the interest so that you develop always your brain, because he also was a brain specialist at the end of his life. And um, 
we are speaking about willpower and that was a very very interesting conversation <laughs> because we tested willpowers and um, he tested uh, his uh, the pattern that he of course had a theory how the willpower goes and he wanted to test it to his Nobel Prize uh, colleagues and no one really uh, dared to do it <laughs> and uh, he had he tested on us as musician and including my daughter who was five years old we had no problem of willpower as a musician and that was very very interesting because we are doing something with abstract right mm -hmm. Willpower, as f as far as w what does that look like? Is that determination, determination. to do our work? Is yeah. that determination to have the courage to go on stage? Or what did he mean by well, willpower? Well, in this case, his test was a pattern that was turning, and then at some point it turns back. So with your willpower, you have to turn back again to the direction that was original. And the beginning is easy, and then it get, gets to a pattern that gets more difficult, and the third one is the most difficult. And most people could barely do the first one, not the second and the third. But musicians had no problem. Was it his belief that willpower is something you're born with, or is it something that can be developed? That I didn't ask. <laughs> That's a good question. So for, for you as a musician, what's your instinct about that? I think that we're born with it, I think. Because there was one of the musicians who was kind of intellectual and he was the only one he couldn't, who couldn't reverse the, the power. <laughs> Mari, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation about life. We talked about music, but it's yes. really about life. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>